So, I think we can start. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Today, we are delighted to attend Ugo Pagano Skinot speech. Let me say that uh, when I was undergraduate at Siena, I attended just one course because I was, I am very lazy. This course was uh, the course in political economy of uh, Ugo Pagano. Needless to say, his lessons fascinated me from the beginning and have been affecting my research since that time. So I am very honored to introduce him. Ugo Pagano is professor of economic policy at uh, the University of Siena where he is also the president of Santa Chiara Graduate School. He is visiting professor at the Central European University in Budapest as well. Pagano's fields are in complete contracts, institutional complementarity theory, intellectual property rights, evolutionary economics. He published, among others, on Cambridge Journal of Economics, Journal of Economic Behavior Organization, International Review of Law and Economics, Journal of Bioeconomics, Journal of Institutional Economics. Today, he will talk about the corporation in the age of intellectual monopoly capitalism. So, Ugo, the floor is yours. Massimiliano, thank you very much for this nice introduction and uh, for organizing all this. I mean, uh, everything was really well done. And uh, I must say that, uh, well, for Italians, I mean, it's clear that uh, being my name Ugo and your name Massimiliano, it was a matter of fate uh -huh. that we should uh, join together because uh, one of the most uh, popular Italian movies is uh, Ricomincio the Tree, and uh, there is this person who is deciding uh, finally to accept to be the father of a child, and then they are discussing about the name, and then the woman says, well, let's call the guy Massimiliano, and the guy says, well, no, that's not possible, because uh, Massimiliano is too long. It, it's impossible to educate a person called Massimiliano, but the time you try to tell him not to do something, it's already away while you say Massimiliano. <laughs> Let's call him Ugo. So <laughs> he will stop immediately. And uh, well, then say, well, maybe that Ugo, then he will come out to repress the guy. So let's say Chiro. So something that we could uh, have a common name, something like Ciro Vaghiero or something like this, and uh, we can, uh, <laughs> I don't know what. Yeah. <laughs> okay, being uh, uh, the last one, I mean, I, I've enjoyed very much the conference and I've learned quite a lot. And uh, of course, the more you learn, the less you have to say. So <laughs> that may be a good thing, you know, being the last speech. But I will start immediately with uh, one uh, issue that uh, I learned for, uh, from two of the keynote speakers uh, even uh, before coming to this uh, conference. And uh, these uh, are uh, the importance of the concept of commitment and uh, esteem. Uh, Colin Meyer has emphasized very much the importance of commitment Petit has emphasized the importance of uh, esteem. And I believe that in human evolution, commitment and esteem play a central role. And uh, the, the funny thing, in a way, is that uh, the commitment is particularly strong when it is addressed to non-human persons. So the totem, the god, 
anything that is embodying, uh, if you like, the personality of the group uh, is something you are strongly committed to, and people command more esteem uh, exactly in the case uh, in which they are strongly committed to this entity, which is a non-human entity. This is a, a very interesting aspect of uh, human personality. From an evolutionary point of view, of course, it makes very much sense, because the moment that uh, the group becomes you know, an entity and you identify with this, you do very well in group selection. And you know, these tribes were fighting each other, and the one that were identifying more with this type of uh, no human person were the ones that were surviving. And uh, in fact, uh, when uh, Cortes went to uh, Mexico, he found this uh, situation in which people were uh, only too ready to kill and be killed for uh, their gods and uh, for uh, the people you know, who were fiduciaries on earth of these gods. And uh, individuals feel part of a single organism because really cultural diversity and cultural evolution makes groups real selection units. Uh, in uh, biology, uh, group selection cannot easily work because there is gene flow that uh, implies that you cannot really preserve uh, very easily the characteristic of a group. Uh, but in the case of cultural evolution, this is different because, of course, uh, culture creates all sorts of barriers in terms of linguistics, uh, barriers, uh, way of expressing yourself, flags, way of coloring yourself, and so on. And uh, usually the group is treated as an independent entity characterized by a superhuman personality that uh, pre-exists and goes beyond human life. And uh, if you like, it's usually an insurance against the fragility of human life, you know, because the group, you know, survives you or you identify with this thing. And uh, this is uh, what you have in uh, some situations that are not pleasant at all, but uh, still uh, work on this identification. But then you have a more interesting type of identification on which our civilization is built. For instance, uh, Socrates in Plato Crito, the laws really like persons, as Socrates, since you were born, nurtured and educated through our means, can you say, first of all, that you are not both our offspring and our slave, as well you as your ancestors? So the rule of law requires Socrates to accept the death sentence and not to expect from jail. And uh, really the laws of the community are seen as an independent corpus. And uh, from this point of view, those laws are very similar to the rules of uh, the Aztec gods. Of course, they are a completely different thing and they are a much more civilized thing but uh, still uh, they build on this similar commitment you know, to group identity, which is a very strong thing. And the commitment to this uh, impersonal thing is uh, really the basis of uh, self-esteem. So legal personality is very important for having the rule of law. If the power of all individuals, including that of the present rulers, is constrained by the rule of law, the state must be an independent person. And it must be able to have powers and liabilities, and rights and duties, transcending the particular person that is acting in a certain moment on his behalf. So in a way, the state must be a corporation. It must have an independent corpus. It must pre-exist you, go beyond you, and so on. Now, a similar mechanism is characterizing other institutions, such as churches, monasteries, uh, universities, they are all independent legal persons. And as they are Aztec priests, their temporary rules are supposed to identify with the community missions that is uh, defining uh, their personality and shaping uh, the rules that they produce. Now, the state, the church, and all these things are legal persons. Let's talk now 
about something that gets closer to the business corporation. We have already heard quite a lot about charter corporations. Charter corporation came out from a need to decentralize the orderings of national states. In a way, you know, these uh, things that were done far away in India or in Canada could not be officially controlled in, by the English national state. You needed to decentralize a lot of power and charter companies uh, basically were doing this type of job. And they became independent legal persons that were able to own goods and stipulate contracts. They also became uh, corporations with a lot of uh, characteristics that uh, they had also forms of limited liability and so on. And uh, as a corollary, this is uh, something that has been already pointed out by Jeff Hodgson, because a legal person cannot contract or cannot sue itself, then chartered corporation had also to administer justice within the corporation itself. In that case, it was a very dramatic type of organization. East Indian Company had got its own army, its own judges, uh, it could uh, execute people, and so on. But, uh, you know, it was uh, a very sophisticated internal ordering. Now, from this point of view, these uh, corporations were seen often in the Smithian tradition as some exchange between uh, monopolies uh, and uh, some uh, favor to the king. They were seen uh, as something that was anti-competitive, uh, but indeed there was a deal between uh, the sovereign and the company because these companies were building uh, the infrastructure, the institutional infrastructure in those countries. And in fact, when uh, then uh, the British state took over, in some cases, these companies were not unhappy at all because they could save on the infrastructure. They will get competition, but they will not have to pay any more for the infrastructure. The business corporation is different. The charter corporation made clear the advantages that firms could derive from having an independent legal personality. And in this way, the way was paved to free incorporation so that you could uh, incorporate for all sorts of uh, business. And then uh, the corporation had some uh, potential uh, immortality, could make lasting contracts, could commit, and uh, a lot of uh, Contracts and litigation would uh, be now internalized within uh, the corporation and they will just become uh, interaction on which the management could say something, mediate and express judgments. In fact, according uh, to Fuller, also the employer may find it convenient to have a legal system in miniature and an internal rule of law. And uh, it is true that the employer may be the one who decides which one are the rules. But even in this case, according to Fuller, he is going to be constrained by his own rules because if he's changing his own rules too often, then he's not getting any advantage from uh, a behavior that is guided by rules. So you cannot change rules too often even if you are a dictator, if you want to have any advantage from your rules. And uh, in fact, I think that Fuller uh, is uh, very interesting. I think that it has had a very important uh, role in uh, kicking out the lawyers from a legal nirvana in the same way in which Coase has kicked out economists from economic nirvana. There are two symmetric intellectual enterprises because Fuller defined law, in fact, as the enterprise to subject to rules human behavior. This type of enterprise would be too costly if it was carried uh, by centralized ordering. And it was possible to decrease the cost of law if you decentralize it, this activity of rule setting, uh, rule making, rule enforcing uh, to other bodies, 
so churches, universities, uh, and so on, and also firms. And uh, according to Fuller, there is no legal nirvana. One can aim at the completeness, unity, and consistency of a legal ordering, but this can be objective and not things that necessarily exist at each moment of time. So, if you like, Fuller's journey was to start from the observation that centralized public orderings were costly, and uh, he moved to the idea of the firm as one of the forms by which the public orderings could be decentralized. Coase was doing something that was uh, similar. He observed that in the world of uh, pure economics, all decisions were coordinated by prices at zero cost. Also there, there was a nirvana that was not in terms you know, of rules, with, of centralized rules that costed nothing, but in terms of transactions, of market transactions that costed nothing. And in this world, firms will not exist. We will live uh, in the situation that is described by the cost theorem. But the cost theorem is uh, not the Cosian theory. One should not confuse the two things. It's uh, really a word that is a paradoxical one where firms, state regulations, and other arrangements are uh, useless. Why? Because if there is one institution that can work at zero cost, the other institution do not make sense if they are costly. And if they are not costly, then it is a matter of indifference with type of institutional mix you are going to choose. So there is no economic nirvana. All institutions uh, are costly. We have uh, a Chiro paper together <laughs> that uh, we have done. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's coming out now on joy, I think, the next issue. And uh, you can look at Cosa's journey as something that is very similar to, symmetric at least, to the journey of uh, um, Fuller. In this case, the starting point is the observation that there are costly decentralized market transactions and you have the emergence of the firm as a centralization of market transactions. So in one case, the firm is emerging as some form of decentralization of the public ordering. In the other case, it is emerging as a centralization of market transactions. They seem to be different theories, but if you think about it, they are saying something that is very similar. Because when you have got decentralized market transaction, what you are doing, in fact, is using a public courts and the public orderings. So a movement towards firms must involve both things, some private ordering and some centralization of market transactions. So we can say that, in fact, this was a joint journey. Costly centralized market transaction and costly centralized public orderings involved an emergence of the firm as a centralization of market transaction and as a decentralization of uh, the public ordering. Now, another way in which we can look at the theory of the firm is uh, by referring uh, at another important author of all law in economics, with uh, Guido Calabresi. Guido Calabresi as uh, this structure of law, if you like, in terms of increasing uh, transaction cost, with low transaction cost, we have property rules and contracts. With very high transaction costs, we will have negligent rules and criminal law. But then there are in between uh, liability rules, which involve uh, a huge saving of transaction cost. Because for instance, you first let an accident happen and then after that you bargain. But of course you bargain then in situation of bilateral monopoly because uh, you cannot reallocate the damage to some competitor. You may want to have uh, hit uh, a nice person uh, in a nice uh, small uh, panda or mini, whereas you were hitting an awful guy on a Mercedes and it's going to be very costly, but there is no way you can 
reallocate the damage. Now, we can add to this another column, and the other column is, uh, if you like, the Williamson column, because, as a matter of fact, both Calabresi and Williamson involve a fundamental transformation that makes monopoly and competition to different stages of uh, the same relation. Many relations start possibly as competitive, but then uh, they turn out later to become a bilateral monopoly. Before uh, the accident, we will be, we are all persons who could have contracted in terms of insurance and possible accidents with other people in competitions, but after the accident, there is a fundamental uh, transformation. We have now to bargain with that particular person and we are in a situation of bilateral monopoly. And the argument of Williamson uh, is very similar. Let's see first Calabresi fundamental transformation. Because of the high number of possible accidents, negotiation occur after individuals have disinvested in specific assets. So in principle, you can have ex ante competition and make deals in some cases with people with whom you may have in the future accidents, but this is too costly because of transaction cost. And so you have this fundamental transformation and uh, because uh, after uh, the accident, uh, you are in a situation of bilateral monopoly, then you need to have transaction under court supervision because that there is no any discipline role of competition after the accident. Williamson uh, fundamental transformation is saying that because of the high number of possible events, negotiation occur after individuals have invested in specific assets. Also here, there is a fundamental transformation. And the fundamental transformation is that you may decide to employ a person for uh, running uh, your firm, your department. Many people may be good candidates and you are not the only employer, you are in, com in a competition with other employers. But then after this person works for your firm for a while, this person is acquiring some skills that make the replacement of this person very difficult on the one hand, and on the other hand, it is very difficult for this person to find employments where these skills are equally valuable because this person knows now a lot about that particular business, but not about other business. So, in a way, we can also here join these two stories, and these two stories can be joined in this way, that both Calabresi and Williamson start from the idea that there is an ex-ante contractual incompleteness, and uh, because uh, it is uh, impossible or too costly to have ex-ante contracts, you try to build on uh, expose verification capabilities. The case of uh, Calabresi is a case uh, in which uh, you start with public orderings and uh, independent agents. And uh, because uh, of uh, this situation, the verification is done uh, by public courts. And the case of Williamson is a situation where you utilize private orderings and usually in these private orderings, uh, or very often, individuals are employed as they are in the case that they are employees of a corporation. When uh, do you move from one to the other? Well, you move from one to the other when uh, there is such a frequency in relations that you need uh, particular skills, particular uh, dis uh, capabilities, uh, to adjudicate disputes, and then you create a public private ordering. Otherwise, you rely on a public ordering. So, in a way, we can celebrate a fuller cause marriage in uh, Calabresi Cathedral. The corporation can be seen as a child of the marriage embodying the genes of both parents, a centralization of market transaction and the decentralization of the public ordering. Both processes require the formation of an autonomous legal entity, and the main feature of the corporation is not a common property of human assets, 
but a system of common liabilities and of centralized power, which inter alia allows the centralization of a calabresi type of judicial function. Now, these uh, are uh, interesting uh, contribution. I find, uh, from this point of view, the new property types of approach less interesting. Less interesting for the fact that there is a non-fundamental transformation. The idea is that in this case, I don't want to spend much time on that, but it's uh, a useful point for people uh, who are familiar with this type of approach. In uh, Hart's theory that is very popular among uh, economists, uh, lacking course verification, then uh, ex post bargaining is not going uh, to be constrained by competitive markets. So you are in a situation you should make investment in human capital in the first period, and you know that in the second period, there is no complete contract that is saying that you will get the return from this investment. But you know that. You know the future bargaining. You anticipate it in the first period. And what you do in the first period, you just exchange machines to, great, to give the greatest incentive to the person who has to make the most valuable uh, investment in human capital. But observe that then uh, all the action in the second period is anticipated in the first period and basically, there is not really a fundamental transformation because all the action is happening only in uh, the first period. So from this point of view, there is uh, not, in this uh, case, a structure that is uh, uh, either uh, in terms of uh, public courts or uh, private orderings, but there are just exchanges for the things for which there are zero transaction cost knowing that for other things, contracts are impossible because third parties have got, say, infinite transaction uh, verification cost. So judges and uh, um, managers cannot know who is right, who is wrong, who was really doing the investment in human capital. So although the two guys know everything, they can anticipate the future bargaining. They also know that writing a contract is not something that is worthwhile because judges and in general third parties will not be able to know who is right and who is wrong. And so contracts cannot be enforced, so it's not worthwhile uh, writing them and they will say incomplete. So this is another literature that I think is uh, less interesting. It's not really a theory of the corporation. And in fact, in this uh, literature, when you look at the practical example, like uh, the famous integration between uh, GM uh, and Fisher body, the issue is that uh, because uh, of the ownership uh, of uh, some physical capital, Fisher body was holding up. GM, and for this reason they integrated. I think that this story does not make uh, much sense. The GM and Fisher body, by the way, were already partners and they had the common interest, so it's not clear why one should hold up the other. And uh, it, what is uh, more interesting is to refer directly to the memories of Alfred Sloan and Alfred Zone had, had a lot of problems. You know, he devised you know, this idea of management, uh, of top management being separated from the management of the divisions so that top management could have this type of uh, judicial function. And uh, one case that he describes in his book was when this uh, famous inventor, a GM, Kettering, wanted the, the cars with an air cooling system, and the air cooling system did not work, and uh, you know, all uh, the um, cars, the Chevrolet in particular, were uh, going uh, to uh, blow up, and uh, that was a serious problem for uh, uh, GM. And uh, then according to Sloan, 
the idea was great, but the engineering department uh, could not do its job, whereas, you know, according to the engineering department, they were doing their job, but, you know, the catering uh, did not understand that the invention was not a good one. And then he understood that things should be somehow unified, so that should, you would not go to court for that, and you should have uh, top management having exactly a judicial function, not to be directly involved with the working of the department, but to work as a third party. And in fact, when was that Fisher body and the GM integrated? Well, it was when there was a move from that type of car, which was open body, to a closed body one. Why? Because a closed body car meant that you had to put the engine that is very heavy in a certain position to have the car as low as possible, to have the car to hold the road. And uh, at that point, the engine and the body of the car had to be built together. They were co-specific. And that's why you got this integration, because in the end, consumer wanted to have uh, a joint uh, liability of the firm in the case that the car was not holding the road and it was impossible you know, for the consumer to know whether it was the fault of the builder of the engine or the builder of the car. So that integration became necessary and the system of joint profit but also joint liabilities became very important. Observe that the same thing has not happened for airplanes and uh, for boats. Why? Because you do not have the same problem. And uh, the builders of engines and the builders of uh, the bodies of uh, these other vehicles have stayed independent. Now, given uh, this uh, situation in which the corporation is uh, something that uh, is uh, internalizing uh, transactions and where you are decentralized uh, a judiciary function, then uh, unsurprisingly, the corporation is seen as some form of uh, a degenerate child. But then you can uh, see the corporation as a degenerate child of the market and competitive markets, or you can see the corporation as a degenerate child of the state. These are the two possible views, because you have two parents. So many economists, as themselves, have seen the corporation as generated by high transaction costs that make it convenient to centralize contracts in the corporations. However, the corporation is seen as a degenerate child of the market, its powerful incentives are lost, and managers' incentives are not aligned with the goals of the shareholders. The remedies are strong incentives for uh, managers and to align shareholders' uh, interests <coughs> with uh, managerial uh, behavior and so on. Interesting enough, Posner has got the opposite view of the degenerate child. He says that the business corporation, in fact, ended up having a legal personhood similar to that of other public organizations, and uh, it had some advantages as well. It had an inner dynamism that uh, superior to other organizations because the other organizations, like national states, had their action restricted to a territory or to specific missions or uh, to a particular faith, like religious organization. The business corporation had no territorial limitation, no specific mission, and no faith constraining uh, its opportunities. But the problem is the territory, mission, and faith do not simply constrain personalities. They also define their identities. So if we talk about those identification mechanisms that we have seen existing for uh, the Aztecs or uh, for Socrates, clearly they are likely to be stronger for the nation than they can be for the corporation. And this may be particularly important for this no mortal legal person because they can work if somebody identifies with them. So, in case of Posner, the corporation stems from the centralization 
of legal personality to something that is some sort of a half person that has not a very well uh, defined identity, and this half person can be sold and bought on the market. In this case, the benchmark for the degenerate child are the public bodies uh, that generated it and have got much stronger identification mechanism that the corporation does not have. Well, usually if you have a degenerate child, sometimes you also have degenerate parents, and if the corporation was generated by costly markets and or by costly centralized ordering, they had not, it had not perfect parents. So in fact, all institutions are costly, and uh, this uh, is what makes institutional analysis so interesting. So the general parents generated the general children, and there is really no perfect benchmark, either a perfect state or a perfect market to which the corporation should be compared. We are always dealing with uh, imperfect uh, solution and with a very impure uh, world of mixed institutions. In fact, we should perhaps look at business corporation as to half persons. Why half persons? Because uh, a full person has got, I think, two requirements. One is that he can buy, sell, own things. And on the other hand, usually it cannot be sold on the market, it cannot be owned by other, and so on. And observe that this is true for humans if they are not slaves, but it is also true for churches, for uh, universities, for states. You cannot buy them and sell on the market. Whereas the corporation has got this double nature. It is uh, a person that can own things and is a thing that can be bought and uh, sold on the market. So the problem is that things are then hardly compatible with persons. They cannot command much esteem for uh, the people committed to them, and they cannot make commitments that real people are going to trust. Because if it is a thing that now has some owners, then it will have different owners, then you are not going to trust it very much. So if the thingness of the corporation invades all its personality, then even its economic advantages fade away. Its capability to make commitments, this was a point of Colin Mayer, it's uh, something that, you know, it becomes very problematic. Now, how can you keep this uh, degeneration under control? And the degeneration is due to the fact that shareholders may have a long-term advantage from the fact that the person, uh, as a person, the corporation can make commitments with other parties, but they can also sell the corporation and make gains, so you cannot really then trust the corporation anymore. So for some time, two different institutional arrangements will keep the degeneration of the corporation under control. At the time of the second, uh, and the two uh, systems, are the American system, uh, I would say, and the European system, I know that uh, this is very schematic, but really the case of the American system is uh, the case of a system with uh, a strong uh, democracy when corporations were created, and uh, then uh, large block holdings were uh, stopped by political authorities, antitrust law was immediately enacted, the Clayton Act was particularly important because it stated that uh, if you were having a 5% in one corporation, 10% in another, then you would do a lot of advantageous self-dealing. If you were making contract favoring, to the, favored, favoring the corporation where you were owning the 10%, it said that the 5%, and both the 5% and the 10% could have been enough, you know, to influence the decisions of the corporation. And also then Roosevelt uh, 
dismantled uh, pyramids that uh, were a way by which with very little capital you would uh, control a lot of capital. And so there was an exceptional early dispersion of capitalist interest. And uh, this also made less important to have organized labor. So you got really a dispersed equilibrium. And the fact that both shareholders on the one hand and uh, workers were uh, not strongly organized gave a lot of autonomy to management. And this was a route by which corporation could somehow commit and act as person. So the thingness was under control because of this particular type of uh, arrangement in the United States. So the American anti-degenerative me ma uh, medicine is uh, really based on ownership dispersion and weak unions and uh, the independence of management in this case have allowed managers to make commitments on behalf of the corporation in this way, the corporation could not be easily treated as a thing and could often act as a reliable person. When uh, you look at uh, the European corporation, European countries had much more aristocratic origins. Aristocratic privileges were hardly disputed when big uh, corporations emerged. And uh, there was not strong democratic authority that could uh, limit the concentration of power of the capitalist dynasties in big firms. And then there was a social democratic reaction because of that. So that some form of concentrated equilibrium emerged with uh, strong unions and strong blockholders. Which one is the anti-degenerative medicine in Europe? Well, the distribution of rights entailed a stronger incentive for owners and their heirs to invest in human capital, and employment protection created conditions favorable to firm specific investment also for some workers. So in this case, the personality of the business corporation is saved from uh, its uh, thing type of character because there is some identification with the fate of the family dynasty and also with the countervailing uh, uh, power of the unions, and German co-determination is an obvious example of this arrangement. Now, both these uh, anti-degenerative medicines have uh, had uh, some uh, clear uh, limitation, and uh, they have uh, really failed because of uh, the strong financialization of the economy. Financial pressure makes managers of Anglo-American corporation treating the corporation as a thing, and they have to extract a lot of value, otherwise there is uh, the danger of uh, a takeover. And whenever they make strong commitments to stakeholder, there can be the temptation of takeover, break the commitment to the stakeholder, and make more money. So that financial pressure may basically make the corporation behaving as a thing. And uh, financial pressure can have uh, also the same effect on uh, European family dynasties that can sell their assets to raiders and break the commitments that they have taken with the other stakeholders. The weakening of the unions, of course, is making all this much easier. However, we cannot really understand this phenomena if we do not consider a figure that basically is the same one that you have already seen yesterday. It's slightly different, but it's the same one that uh, uh, was shown by Colin Mayer. And uh, the, a big mutation has happened in terms of the assets of capitalism. And uh, if you look at what happened uh, from uh, 1982, from uh, 1999, in 1982, the intangible assets mattered for the 38% of the assets of the corporation. In 1999, they became the 84%. So machines, buildings, and these things that were the 62% in 1982 had become the 16% in 
in 1999. Big change. And this big change is somehow related to financialization and the change that we have seen in many economies. Intellectual monopoly capitalism, big corporations have now moved from being rich in machines to being rich in intellectual monopoly, which means that they are rich in terms of their trademark that is uh, very valuable and very well protected. They are rich in patents. They basically own a technological path. And uh, this has started in 1908 in uh, America with the Bad Doyle Act. But then uh, the system of strong intellectual property rights has become the international standard uh, in 1994 with the TRIPS agreement and the institution of the WTO authorizing commercial sanctions against countries breaking intellectual property. Now, corporations have exploited the huge economies of scales and the scope that arise when knowledge becomes a private input. They have also been able to decentralize production to firms in low labor cost countries. Because once you have strong intellectual property rights, then uh, you can outsource a lot from the corporation. You can uh, move production away. You are protected by your trademark and your intellectual uh, property rights. So it's a big change of these uh, corporations. And here we have this uh, knowledge economy paradox. The no rival uh, nature of knowledge, which could in principle favor uh, small uh, and even self-managed firms, is, create, is used to create economies of size which make a cheap acquisition and the defense of property rights possible only for big business. If there is no knowledge privatization, since knowledge is a no rival good, we can all use the same uh, chemical formula and uh, to use uh, Jefferson's uh, sentence, uh, knowledge is like a candle, you can light other candles without decreasing the flame of the original candle, then uh, this environment of the knowledge intensive economy should be ideal for small firms and you don't need big business. But if knowledge is privatized, exactly because of these characteristics of uh, knowledge that with one piece of knowledge, no rival good, potentially, you can produce many, many, many units of outputs. This becomes a source of economies of scale that even the biggest plant has nothing similar to it, okay? Because even the biggest plant, after a while we deteriorate, whereas a piece of knowledge can be used an infinite number of times without deteriorating. And uh, the economies of scope are even more important because often one piece of knowledge that you own privately is an important one only if you have other complementary pieces of knowledge. And from this point of view, there is, a, of course, a big problem that is known in the literature as the anti-common problem, that once the ownership of knowledge becomes too fragmented, it is very difficult to have new innovation and uh, to move uh, further the frontier uh, of knowledge. Let me refer to another uh, very nice uh, uh, keynote speech by Simon Deakin. Simon uh, was uh, saying uh, that you could look at the corporation as managing a common. Yes, in a way, this is true, but it is uh, a strange type of common because if really the corporation own certain technology, certain knowledge, and certain things like this, on the one hand, they are solving the anti-common problem. Suppose that each individual own a different piece of knowledge then it would be impossible to produce anything. So by putting many pieces of knowledge in the same corporation, 
and making it a common pool of knowledge, you are able to progress. But at the same time, knowledge can be a global common. And in a way, it is a global common because it's a non-rival good. So it's very different from the case of the commons that were case of local public goods and uh, were uh, rival goods, in a way, subject to overcrowding. The case of knowledge is not the case in which there is an overcrowding. We can all use the same knowledge, you know, many times without crowding it and making it less productive. So they are managing a common, but it's a common that is artificially created in terms of private ownership of uh, knowledge. And uh, the problem is that the moment that you have this common, then uh, you are blocking all the people who do not have access to this common. In a way in which the people who own uh, a local common in Elinor Osrom are not blocking the others. Okay, there is no global monopoly for that piece of land that uh, Olmström is referring to. So these are particular type of commons, and once you have got a set of patents, a set of intellectual property rights, you are the only one that can progress without fear of being blocked on a certain intellectual uh, path. So because of this situation, we can have Vicious and virtuous circles. If you are employed in one firm where you have uh, the monopolistic uh, ownership of a lot of intellectual property, then uh, you develop skills because you are not scared that you are going to be expropriated for uh, your uh, innovations because uh, you own uh, the relevant inputs in terms of patents and other things. So you develop your capabilities, you acquire even more intellectual property, more intellectual properties, more intellectual capabilities embodied in people, and so on. But you can also be in a vicious circle, and because of this terrible outsourcing due to intellectual property rights, many, many economies are now in these vicious circles, and many, many firms, because of lack of intellectual properties, you do not have the incentive to develop capabilities, and because you do not have the incentive to develop capabilities, you never acquire or develop intellectual property. The link between uh, commodification of knowledge and finalization of the economy is uh, a strong link. The commodification of knowledge allows the firm to be treated as a thing on financial markets. This is not the same if a lot of knowledge is uh, embodied in individuals. The more knowledge becomes embodied uh, in piece of papers, in monopolistic rights, the more it can be used as collateral, exchanged uh, on uh, the financial markets, and the financial markets have more material to define the property rights on. In turn, the financialization of the economy induces companies to go modify their intellectual capital because each moment that it can be set into rules, patterns, and things like this, it becomes an effective form of property that is appealing for uh, shareholders or as collateral for banks. So, in a way, this uh, intellectual monopoly capitalism is very much related to the financialization of the economy that is now about these firms that, if you like, are a bit empty boxes because the workers are away. There are not many machines. They are themselves, if you like, piece of papers, then good research department, marketing, and so on and not much else, okay? But they are incredibly valuable on the stock exchange because they own some technological future that other firms do not have. So, 
the intangible corporation has become an irresponsible thing. Thanks to strong IPRs, production can be outsourced and many stakeholders have lost rights in the corporation. Since its profits derive mainly from intellectual monopoly, the knowledge intensive corporation is also a litigation intensive one. Because of course everyone says I am the one who discovered these things first and it's my property. As a shareholder thing, the corporation is ready to find all the possible ways to defend and expand the knowledge disembodied from the workers and uh, this knowledge is also owned as a thing. The main advantage of legal personality lies now on the possibility of assembling large packages of complementary knowledge and partially overcoming uh, the anti-commons probability tragedies that arises from uh, knowledge privatization. But this is a partial solution and this comes together with an even greater uh, monopoly power of the modern corporations. And in fact, we can say that we are in a situation where now these corporations have again a big monopoly power. The monopoly power used to be on a territory. This is the Hudson Bay that you see here, but now you have the same monopoly power on a field of knowledge. And uh, there are many undesirable consequences. It's not clear how much can be done in terms of reforming the corporation and in terms of changing the infrastructure of the economy and having more knowledge in the public space instead of privatized knowledge. The problem is that intellectual monopoly has uh, usually been described as some sort of trade-off between some static inefficiency, you don't give access to other uses that are available for free, for having some dynamic efficiency because you can get intellectual property, there is an incentive, you know, to make investment in innovation. Now, what is not considered is that there is also a dynamic inefficiency of intellectual property. Because if uh, a lot of knowledge is privatized and it's become the monopoly of somebody else, then all investments, all innovative investments become very, very risky because you can be always blocked by others. And uh, we have seen uh, recent phenomena like patent trolls, that is patents that are explicitly dedicated to blocking others instead than uh, producing uh, something new that has become uh, a very important uh, aspect. Now observe that the incentive uh, effect comes immediately if you reinforce intellectual property rights. You immediately go rush, you know, for these uh, new gold mines. The blocking effect comes later. Once you have colonized these virgin territories and many technological trajectories are blocked by some patent and the other. And somehow you can uh, look at IPRs as some form of global tariffs. In fact, an IPR is defending uh, you much more than a tariff. With the highest tariff, you can only protect your own uh, market. With the IPR, you can have the global market. And the others have to ask for permission to produce the same uh, thing. So from this point of view, there is a, a blockage of investment opportunities. Of course, some countries are uh, less blocked than others, but the overall blockage effect has been uh, one of the causes of the current depression. This is uh, something that I've done with Filippo Bello, that I think is here. And uh, you can see how global investments have peaked after the enforcement of intellectual property rights and uh, then uh, at the beginning uh, of uh, the last decade there has been an investment crisis. 
So we have these uh, two different dynamics, and we may say that even the financial crisis has been due much more to a famine of investment and to a blockage of investment than to a saving lot. I mean, people were speaking about a saving lot, but there was not an increase in saving, there was a fall in investments. Then uh, a lot of uh, savings could not be used in new productive uh, things that were really improving wealth, and then went into some sort of uh, speculation, uh, bubbles, and things like this. How to improve uh, corporate personality? One remedy has been uh, already considered, one way for, uh, the, for fighting the increasing thinness of the corporation is to decrease the power of shareholders and the pressure of financial markets. But a complementary policy is directly to weaken uh, corporate intellectual monopoly. More knowledge in the public space and more knowledge embodied in workers are likely to make corporations more committed to people because now they have again people inside and they have to deal with them and less responsive to financial markets. Weakening intellectual monopoly may improve corporate personality and its capability to commit, may also be good for uh, the global economy because it may open uh, new innovative investments and it may also improve wealth distribution. The privatization of knowledge has had terrible consequences on wealth distribution. On the one hand, you have got this divide between these corporations that are now become intensive uh, in uh, monopoly rights, but many workers, you know, are outside them and in very poor uh, conditions. And uh, at the same time, of course, once, you know, something knowledge is taken away from uh, the public space and moved to the private one, I mean, if knowledge is a public good, is uh, distributed in a, in a very egalitarian way, in the most egalitarian way, and uh, then it is moved in the private space and one owns, owns the knowledge and the other ones do not. So, I mean, the well distribution can also improve. I think, last slide, that uh, we should stop what we may see as a chartering reversal. Corporations started with the charter granting them a monopoly. Then business corporations were supposed to face competitive conditions and charter was supposed to be unnecessary, okay, because competition would take care of everything, so everyone could always incorporate. New intangible intens intensive corporations have substantial monopolies, but no charter limiting their power. Traded as things in financial markets, their profitability dictates charters to states, specifying what these states can do and cannot do to compete for their investments. This chartering reversal should be stopped. It is not only undermining the global economy, but also our democracies, which together with corporation are becoming things run by financial markets. Democracies must regain the status of full persons, capable of commitment, and must also regain the esteem of their citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, 12 minutes for a general discussion. Questions? Yeah. Microphone, please. Okay. okay. Um, I, I would like to ask a question and a half. The first half question is to implore you not to use the term Anglo-American capitalism until terms like, for example, Italo-German cuisine are, uh, are equally accepted. Uh, Anglo-American capitalism exists in British reality and American textbooks. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, that's just the half one. Um, sure. 
I would also beg a, a distinction among intangibles between brands and, bra and trademarks and brand and trademark protected intangible assets, which you, for good reason, didn't mention, uh, and patent protected sure. intellectual property. Because the aggregate figures for intangibles include both, sure. and I would imagine they are of similar magnitude. But if we are talking about patents, then they are, unlike trademarks, not eternal, generally 20 to 25 years, sure. which in many places, in situations, isn't very long. In many sectors, they are highly ineffective, such as the mechanical sector in sectors in general. They can be invented round everywhere, in principle, and their uh, innovation blocking potential is eased considerably by patent pools, which then bring together large numbers of major corporations so that they don't get in each other's way. Sorry, that was one question. I think you can reply. Um, no, the first half question um, is just a question of time. Uh, in uh, fact, in, uh, I have uh, spent a lot of time uh, distinguishing between the case of uh, England and the case of uh, the United States. They are uh, two completely different cases. And uh, by the way, uh, England uh, is uh, a very um, interesting case for uh, me because uh, if you believe that uh, the nature of the corporation depends on these initial aristocratic conditions, okay, and uh, then countervailing, uh, you know, union power, then uh, the case of England is interesting because then there was a change. Okay, it started, you know, as a, a very aristocratic type of model. Then there was a dispersion of ownership, and uh, then there was a temptation to adopt continental models. And then uh, there was something that, uh, if you like, you know, is uh, in many respects more uh, pro-market oriented than America. So it's, it's a complicated uh, history. And my point is that if you consider uh, the political conditions, then you can explain all that. But if you, for instance, believe in legal origins, then uh, Britain is a fantastic counterexample because with the same <laughs> legal origins, he has had so many different types of uh, arrangements. Okay, so that is uh, a case that I consider very carefully because it's uh, very important for stressing this type of approach, but then I was uh, aggregating things just for reason of uh, time. Uh, for uh, patents, I don't think that, uh, of course you can uh, break patents, you can uh, do all sorts of things and so on, but even uh, if you take some sectors, like for instance, uh, in Italy, we have uh, this uh, fast rain, that is uh, Freccia Rossa, that you may have some time taken, and uh, head of uh, the railways, Moretti, was using this, you know, was always buying this train, preferring them to the Ashton trains, now he has become the president of Film Meccanica, and Film Meccanica owns Ansaldo Breda. That is the builder of Freccia Rossa. Now Film Meccanica owns a lot of things. It's a big conglomerate. He has decided to sell Ansaldo Breda. Why? Because the, I mean, the, the skills are in Italy, but the project belongs to Bombardier. Okay. And his argument is that we cannot do something that is like uh, for uh, metallic carpenters, you know, in a high cost country. 
So we concentrate, for instance, on helicopters. Why? Because we own the project. So we can decide whether we want to decentralize, you know, part of the project in the third world, or which skills to keep here. So you observe, you know, that the, a lot of decisions, what you can do, what you cannot do, what you can decentralize, really depends on who owns the project or the platform and so on. And I'm not talking about a new industry. They were building trains for uh, some centuries. But the novelty is that now intellectual property matters so much. Yeah, back, yeah. Uh, okay. Ah, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I, I wanna push back a little bit at some of the historical account that you're giving of the charter companies and the particular development of um, sort of the corporation in America. Um, first, you talked a little bit about the charter companies as reflecting a kind of decentralization of the state. Um, and I, I want to question whether that works because the companies that you're talking about um, are mostly emerging in the early part of the 17th century um, and the state in Europe or North America doesn't even start to centralize till the late part of the 17th century. I don't even think you can talk about a state in these places until after Westphalia. So uh, that's the first question is I'm not quite sure what you mean by decentralize and I think very similarly um, the corporations that you're talking about in sort of the 19th century industrial revolution uh, in the U.S. predate most of the structures of the modern American state, which really starts to state build after the Civil War. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm not sure if you can actually, the sort of chronology you have where the politics is there before the corporation really works. Can we take uh, one more question? Yep. Yeah. Back. yeah. I, I'd like to uh, ask you a question that's somewhat related to perhaps varieties of capitalism and the slide that you showed with investment. But I also want to start by thanking you for using the word Anglo-American capitalism because uh, as someone who has 20 years experience in international investments and did research in 50 countries in, in investment research and read six languages, I think it's clear that, that it exists more than just in the minds of a few academics. So the question that I've got is, you showed a slide that had uh, a significant increase in intellectual property investment through patents and a drop off in uh, fixed investment. And what I'm wondering is, I'm assuming that's a corporate investment in fixed investment in plant equipment, et cetera, but not necessarily a state investment. So if the state is considered, considerable investments, for instance, in China, et cetera, uh, and many other countries that have invested in infrastructure. Does that picture change at all in your, in your thoughts? Thank you. I think you can reply. Uh, now, I don't know whether uh, I have got uh, my history from uh, completely right, but uh, certainly we had uh, you know, a period of charter corporations. And uh, then, uh, I mean, I think that, I mean, I've really simplified, you know, because uh, uh, the um, charter corporations of colonial time were uh, different from the American one that were used for public utilities. And uh, they also had somehow a charter. But uh, from this point of view, the, um, the American corporation, if you like, has got a different type of origin and uh, was uh, a different type of charter because it was more uh, uh, for canals, things like this, and so on. But the basic point that I want to make was that uh, although, as Colin Mayer said yesterday, we, you can distinguish uh, you know, among six types you know, of stages, and uh, to go much more in detail, uh, I just wanted to make a complex story simple. Uh, corporations, and uh, the use of the legal uh, person required permission until a certain point. And the argument was that there was some monopoly of one type or the other that you were given, could be for the canal, or for the bridge, or for the colony. Then uh, the basic argument for free corporation is that these things could be competitive and you would always uh, incorporate freely whenever you wanted for all uh, legal purposes. And then uh, there is now a third period 
in which we do not have a charter, but we, again, we have a monopoly. And uh, strangely enough, this monopoly is very close to what Simon Digging was calling uh, a common, okay? Because it's partially solving uh, full impedance, you know, the anti-common problem, but of course the pool of these patents is very strong with respect to the others who are outside that, okay? So in fact, when the pool becomes very big, it becomes very similar to a tariff, to a global tariff. Take for instance what uh, is uh, the German organization of Fraunhofer. Okay, Fraunhofer really works together with small firms so there is uh, internal circulations of patents of uh, all uh, intellectual property within the network at some uh, price, everyone uh, not very high, everyone can use the knowledge. Outside the, the network you can make money. Whenever uh, somebody outside the network is infringing your property rights, it's not the single firm that is suing you, but it's Fraunhofer as a whole. And so it's centralizing legal services. Now at this point, this looks very much, you know, really like a global tariffs, and in a way it makes things worse. It makes them better. So you were right from the point of view that within the network, the blocking effect is less, but if you don't belong to the German network, then the things are really tough, you know, from this point of view. And uh, sorry, can you remi remind? Yeah, my, I guess my question was, you have corporations basically realized that they need to invest less because the state oh, yeah, 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 will yeah, invest yeah, yeah, more, yeah, yeah. and so they're yeah. moving no, into intellectual I, I, property. That is, that is a very good question. I, I, I should look at the data. I mean, if, we, if uh, in uh, state uh, investment in some infrastructure was compensating uh, for that or not in uh, some countries. But the issue is, uh, was there an increase? that was such to offset. I, you, 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 you think that looking at China and so on, this is, China, yes, was doing that, you know, but I mean, I should look at the data again to answer your question, I'm sorry, I cannot. Anyway, those data do not include the state investment. Oh, thank you for exposing me to a, the uh, challenge of these excessive monopolies I mean, you've made a very compelling case, I think, and the question is what to do about it. And obviously you need political commitment, and the question is a philosophical one or practical one of politics. How do you change the system to, so you can reclaim the democratic involvement with these monopoly property rights? And I'd like to try out two ideas. One, I've been had about 40 years ago when we didn't have all this intellectual property of an ownership transfer idea which you could apply either to the corporation or to the patents and the philosophy behind it is that the value of patents of corporations is not what the investors put in so much as what the consumers use if you don't have customers or the workers or suppliers to the corporation you don't get value so the, I'm suggesting to you, a line, it would the line of argument being to get, to reduce inequality and to get justice, shouldn't property rights be dynamic so that they flow from the person that creates them to those who create value in them? In other words, the customers would get fly-by points in the patents or in the ownership of the corporations according to their usage. In other words, this is an argument for equity and, re and furthering equality. So how else would you, if you're not attracted to those ideas, how should we proceed to get a commitment from governments to change the rules yeah. somehow? Okay. Just, just a moment. The last question of the symposium, I suppose. Uh, well, it's actually related to this, which w one reads, I mean, and I'm purely at a distance from this, that a lot of the current trade agreements being negotiated worldwide, like the Trans-Pacific one, uh, which is quite developed, and indeed the US, I mean the US Pacific one, but also the US European one, are heavily, heavily focused on 
exactly the protection of patents and property rights, intellectual property rights, um, which actually is pushing, unfortunately, in the, in the other direction. I mean, giving corporations the power of bringing governments to these tribunals to challenge, you know, any weakening in the... I'm not, I don't mind them being strong property rights, just that the matter that they should be shared automatically. Well, I can, uh, I mean, thank you for uh, the question and thank you for uh, your suggestion. I have to think about it. I, I can add uh, one uh, other uh, suggestion, uh, more than uh, policy, if you like, uh, is uh, a rephrasing, but I think it's a uh, useful rephrasing of uh, the problem. I think that we have got uh, a huge free riding problem at international level. Why? Because uh, if I am uh, investing uh, in uh, public knowledge, then uh, because knowledge is an arrival good, then all the countries of the world are benefiting uh, from it. By contrast, if I'm pushing my university, my firm to invest in private knowledge, I think that I can recoup the money in terms of taxes, benefits for my citizens, and so on, and I'm not giving a, you know, a free ride you know, to other countries. However, you can uh, look at this problem as to a problem of unfair competition. Because, uh, think about it, a country that is only you know, producing private investment and is not putting uh, any knowledge in the public space, but is using the knowledge in the public space produced by other countries, is in fact free riding, but it's also doing some uh, unfair competition because the costs you know, of the development of that, new know of that new knowledge are sustained by the other countries using it. So if you consider this problem as uh, a problem also of unfair competition, then uh, I think that one could put some pressure on the WTO to exclude countries from world trade if they do not put a minimum amount of knowledge in the public space. Because if they are doing that, you know, they are basically you know, doing some unfair competition and in the end they are damaging everyone. So this is another way. Then of course there are other uh, ways, but I thought of uh, possible ways and uh, in the end uh, perhaps uh, using the existing institutions may be easier than creating new institutions for this purpose. But, you know, there are many, many ways in this, this problem can be solved if we share that the problem exists. Thank you again. Hi. We have uh, a few minutes for closing remarks, and uh, I would invite uh, Jeff Oxon to close in the symposium. You have uh, five minutes, eight minutes. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for staying to the end of this uh, symposium. Uh, for me, that was not a difficult achievement because I've been thoroughly uh, enthralled by the, the talks and discussion. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the keynotes uh, for, for their contributions. Uh, they've been fantastic, uh, stimulating presentations, and I'll remember them for a long time, so if you join me on the, with the keynotes. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank you for coming. Um, uh, you've been a wonderful audience, wonderful participants, wonderful at questions, wonderful in every way. Um, uh, it adds to a symposium like this that we have high quality discussion and you provided that. So I'll just clap and thank you um, for coming. Um, I also want to thank my colleagues on the Winner Council for helping organize this. Um, it's been very hard work for David and Fr Francesco, who's not here. She's looking after the baby this week, a very sexist winner organization. Uh, um, seriously, no. but. Uh, uh, we take those things seriously. Um, but thank David and thank the others on the Winner Council for, for the work they put in. Uh, but finally, and as I say, last but not least, I want to thank uh, the, the people here in Lugano. 
I want to thank the university and the president and the dean uh, for being so uh, open to this idea, this innovative idea of this interdisciplinary association coming here with all these weird ideas, uh, redoing the world, uh, changing everything for the good or bad, or let's see, uh, but uh, really having a, a very interesting discussion. It's an important and courageous uh, decision by a university as prestigious as this to host a uh, winner symposium on, on a very important uh, topic, which is not only important academically, it's important for the world at large. So I'd like to thank the institution, but also quickly, so we can have a big round of applause, I'd like to thank Massimiano and uh, Marcello for their enormous amount of work they've done. I mean, I, I've had a small glimpse of this through the email correspondence. I know they've been working full flight at this for, for, for more than a month, uh, several months in advance. So, and we've been involved in the early planning stages and it's got very, very intense for the people on the ground here in the, la in the last few weeks. So thank you very much indeed. It's you that made the initiative to invite a winner to come to this conference. And it's you that's provided us with an excellent environment, excellent location, and a lot of hard work to make this a, a very successful event. So thank you very much indeed. So finally, I'd like to say, um, see you in Rio de Janeiro, uh, if, if we can. If not, we hope to see you again at another winner event or somewhere else where we bump into each other and continue our wonderful conversations about institutions and about uh, changing them and designing better ones. Thank you very much indeed. Just, just a moment, please. If someone needs a taxi, I just printed out some num a number here, okay? Some slaves, some slaves, by the way, were things, but some were house persons. They were allowed, they were allowed to own few things, although they were owned. So to get to the <laughs> but, but basically yeah, you can liquidate you yeah well right, you can but then you can it's basically like owning when you've got one hundred percent. So to guarantee some independence <laughs> then uh, there is some ambiguity. I mean the the, the case that is uh, the opposite one is the case of the banks, that's uh, the Swedish bank, where indirectly, you know, it was owning itself. Self ownership. That is really a full person. Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. Yes, yes. I, I 
I like very much your paper. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I refer to that, yeah. Yeah, one paper, yes. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah you have written on that, very interesting. I was very interested. Um, sort of, I'm thinking about it again, I was sort of trying to see how I can connect this to the story. So I was wondering, do you want to slide or something? Oh, yes, I can send them to you. Yeah. I'm just to go back on gmail.com. Okay, I'll go to That was very interesting to say, yeah, very, very Nice to meet you, bye.
tornando abbastanza spesso quindi se viene nelle parti di New York io sarò dove stai? a Cornell ah sei a Cornell poi se non è per Italia Italia mezzo a nulla <ride> ciao